Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Faye Stenning. I'm a marketing manager here at InfoTrack. Um, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, where we're going to take a look at what's in store for CQS accredited firms in 2023. We'll have a quick recap on the changes introduced last year, and then we'll look at what's likely to be coming this year. And we'll also cover how to ensure CQS compliance through technology, which is available to support that journey through InfoTrack. So taking you through today's webinar, I'm delighted to be joined by Tracy Thompson, who's a leader assessor for CQS. Um, Tracy is also going to be joined by our national sales manager, Lisa Edwards, who will cover the support that InfoTrack can provide. So before we begin the webinar, I would like to draw your attention to the Q&A tab, which is located at the bottom of your screen. We will be running a Q&A at the end of this session. So if you do have any questions, then please type them in either for Tracy or Lisa, along with your name into the Q&A box. Um, that way, if we do run out of time or if your question requires further clarification, we can extract your information after this webinar and come back with you to follow up afterwards. So um, I think pretty much everyone who is joining is here now. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Tracy so that she can begin today's webinar. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks very much, Faye. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, for those of you who haven't come across me before, my name is Tracy Thompson. I um, uh, work in the um, space of um, risk and compliance. Um, lawyer, 15 years qualified, and Lexel consultant and assessor. Um, property background, and um, I was appointed as lead assessor for CQS back in 2019. So today I'm just going to take you through, um, as, as Bay said, some um, recap on the updates that, um, that came into effect in 2022. Just point those out to you so that you're focusing in the, in the right direction. And I'm going to identify to you the emergence of patterns and trends that are coming out from the, uh, the work that, um, that we do with CQS in terms of um, assessments and, um, and consultancy and reviews. So that, again, you know which areas that you might need to just take a look at in practice, to make sure that you are demonstrating compliance. And then I'll finish off with, um, with bringing to your attention some of the updates which are imminent for CQS practices. So we'll make a start. Um, so hopefully you are all, all aware that there were updates to CQS back in 2022. So we had the original updates which took effect in, um, in May 2019, and we had the, uh, the evolution of the core practice management standard. Um, and then at the end of 2019, uh, the Law Society carried out the on-site assessment pilot, uh, which was undertaken for about three months. And, um, and there was always going to be a period of review and reflection on the back of that for the Law Society to make sure that the process worked for, for them, for the assessors, and obviously for the practices and to be able to uh, make sure that any feedback was was um, obtained and, and the, um, the on-site assessment process was then updated accordingly. But of course we had um, COVID that hit in the meantime. So during that time, um, Law Society wanted to make sure that residential conveyancing practices in particular, uh, with all the difficulties that you had with you know, SDLT holidays and, and obviously um, the, um, the difficulties in practice that everybody was dealing with throughout COVID, that that was um, something that you were able to concentrate on rather than um, what was happening with CQS. However, about a year ago, um, or just over a year ago, February last year, the Law Society did make the announcement that there would be, firstly, a new core practice management standard, which would become compulsory for practices to follow from 1st of May 2022. And they also announced that um, there would be the formal launch of on-site assessments, which would also take effect from 1st of May 2022. And practices were advised that they needed to be assessment ready from that date. So hopefully you all are. Um, but what I want to do next is to just kind of recap for you where the significant changes to the core practice management standard were made. Um, I do a lot of work with um, CQS accredited practices and I still see um, a large proportion of practices that haven't necessarily got to grips with the changes um, that were brought in last year. So if we go through those, and at least then that gives you the, um, the ability to focus your efforts in relation to those specific um, updates, which of course you should now be following in practice. So the 
core practice management standard back in 2022 was updated. It was reformatted from the 2019 version, uh, which is great um, because what we find now is that we have um, a lot more alignment with Lexcel. So if you're a Lexcel accredited practice, you should be about 50% of the way there in relation to CQS because there is about 50% overlap between the um, requirements of, of um, CQS and those identical requirements in Lexcel. Um, so we do now have an alignment uh, whereby the, the format is the same. So um, in a lot of the um, core practice management standard, the numbering is the same as Lexcel. So for Lexcel accredited practices, it's a little bit easier for you to be able to cross-reference um, what requirements sit in what standard. So we had um, the core practice management standard um, updated from 2019, where we went from six chapters to seven chapters. Um, so previously we didn't have people management, so that was um, brought into the 22 version. Um, and we had the increase from 34 individual requirements um, through to 40. And that doesn't necessarily mean there are six new specific requirements, but some of the some of the requirements have been split out. Um, so there were updates to, um, to the majority of the standard. Um, so we didn't have any significant updates to um, chapter one, which is structure and strategy and um, chapter two, which is financial management. Um, so in those sections, um, we, we didn't have any significant um, updates, but in the other um, five sections, which I'll take you through shortly, then we did have some, um, some new requirements and some changes to existing requirements. So a couple of things to know. One is um, what I'm going to bring to your attention in my next slides um, are only the sections where there is a significant change and I'm only detailing the specific um, requirements or the specific subsection. Um, because otherwise, otherwise, if I um, if I did slides for all 40 requirements of the standard, uh, we'd, we'd be here for a lot more than an hour. Um, so obviously, where I show you a slide, it's only where those changes appear that I'm actually going to show you. Um, but some of the things that you need to be mindful of is that um, when we went from this change from 2019 version through to 2022, there were some sections um, or some requirements from the core practice management standard that you might think um, have been stripped out. So I'll give you an example. Um, in the 2019 um, version of the standard, we had uh, the requirement for um, having a, um, a data protection policy. And in the old version, that requirement, which was at 6.1 in the, the old standard, set out, you must have a data protection policy that meets the requirements of legislation. That includes um, A, B, C, D, E, F. So it included, you know, you must have procedures for um, dealing with subject access requests. You must have procedures for dealing with um, um, uh, subjects access requests and data breaches. Uh, you need to make sure that you've appointed a data protection officer. And if you haven't appointed a data protection officer, then you need to set out who is responsible for data protection. So there was a lot more detail involved. So what you will see now in this particular requirement of the standard is that um, data protection is a lot more simplified. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that everything that was contained within the old standard doesn't exist anymore. So there are still minimum expectations. So a lot of these things have been moved to the guidance. So when you read the core practice management standard, do be careful to ensure that you also read the correspondent, corresponding guidance notes as well. Um, another example is information management security. Again, in the old standard, you know, it was very comprehensive, you know, 6.2 A, B, C, D, E, F, I think, which went all the way up to K. So lots of subsections, whereas in this particular requirement um, or this particular version of the standard, it's a lot more simplified that you must have an information management security policy and nothing else. But actually, the minimum expectations are still that you must have those requirements, which are procedures for managing user accounts, for updating software, so it's all the techie stuff. Um, again, move to the guidance notes. Um, so do be mindful of that as well, because I have read somewhere recently whereby 
um, there was, uh, it was implied that you no longer need to have these things in, in practice. Well, you do. It's just that you need to read the guidance notes in accordance with the, the actual um, specific requirements of the core practice management standard. So just to point that out to you, because it is something that I'm coming across on a, a regular basis. Um, so I'll we'll start with changes to information management and security, which is section three of the uh, current version of the core practice management standard. So again, where I've just mentioned to you, um, you must have a policy to manage personal data. So this is making sure that you've got your data protection um, policy in place. It needs to comply with legislation. Um, and again, you know, the detail is, um, is in the legislation and look back at the previous version. Um, so we have this kind of simplified approach, but we still need to make sure that we are um, adequately dealing with data protection, that we do have procedures for data breaches, we do have procedures for um, subject access requests. We are giving consideration to who we're appointing as a data protection officer that is documented, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we need to make sure that we are um, training people on data protection. So obviously we're now, you know, five years down the line from, um, you know, from the flurry of activity that everybody was going through um, in the run up to May 2018 when we had GDPR. Um, so do make sure that you are providing um, training on a, um, a regular basis to keep up to date with, um, with changes in, again, patterns and trends and uh, exposures to risk in relation to data protection. Um, we have this new requirement here, which didn't exist in the old standard that uh, states that we need to ensure that all personnel are kept up to date um, with developments in cybercrime and how they affect the practice. So you choose how that works in your practice and what that looks like. So with CQS and with Lexel, the, you know, the standards are not prescriptive. It doesn't say that you have to do things in a certain way. You make the decision based on you know, your profile of practice, the size, the risks that you're exposed to. No two practices are the same. You'll have different people, different systems, different ways of working, different you know, exposures to risks. So it's the the partners, the decision makers um, that will need to give consideration to how you um, uh, deal with a particular requirement and practice and what that looks like for, for your firm. But we do need to make sure that obviously cybercrime is something that is up there um, in terms of you know an area of focus. Um, I read something recently, 75% of all crime reported in England is um, cyber related. Obviously, the SRA have put out um, statistics over the last um, couple of years, particularly during the pandemic, where everybody's working at home and got heightened exposure to risks, um, whereby you know practices are you know um, are hugely exposed to potential cyber crime attacks. So, to make sure that that is something that is um, is prevalent in in practice, um, I'd like to say that's that's new for this particular requirement. So we've got information management and security. So again, in the previous standard, there was you know um, a lot more detail included, which kind of guided you. But make sure that you do look at um, at that detail because we still expect to see you know all the information relating to you know verification of bank details that appeared in you know in the previous standard and um, you know and making sure that you've got procedures in place for dealing with the firm's bankers and dealing with user accounts and um, and software updates and you know all those technical things that your IT department will be able to assist with. So that's your information management security policy, but you should also make sure that you are accredited against Cyber Essentials. So Cyber Essentials is um, the government um, recommended basic level of um, cyber, um, cyber crime uh, prevention. So it is a series of controls and measures that you would have in place to ideally, hopefully, prevent any cyber attack happening in your practice. What I do come across quite often um, when I have conversations with practices about cyber essentials, if they don't have it, quite often they'll proudly tell me that they have um, cyber essentials or cyber attack um, insurance, um, which, of course, you know, is, is great if the event happens, but, you know, the purpose of having an accreditation is that you then meet the basic requirements of a particular standard so that the incident doesn't happen in the first place. Um, insurance, if it does happen, I'm sure will be great and I'm sure will pay out you know, in X amount of 
time. Um, however, you know, surely prevention is better than cure. Um, if you are unfortunate enough to lose you know, £150,000 worth of client money in a cybercrime attack, then of course the first thing you need to do is to replace that money immediately. Um, the second thing you need to do is to call the SRA and you know who knows how long it will take for any cyber insurance to to actually pay out um so you know i do ask the question to um to a lot of practices um you know are you able would you be able to stand that cost of 150,000 replacing that client money whatever that looks like in practice so um so do be mindful that insurance you know is great but that is a stick in plaster it's about making sure that you've got the controls and measures in place in the first place and that everybody is trained and everybody is aware um, so that these events don't actually happen. The other thing to note as well in relation to Cyber Essentials is that, um, as you'll see, it is a should. So uh, terminology in CQS is, um, is the same as Lexel. Um, if the requirement states that you must have an information management and security policy that applies to everybody and should be accredited against Cyber Essentials, the should is an optional requirement. So if you as a practice choose to not adopt an, an element which is assured, then you should document it and then you should be in a position to be able to have a sensible conversation about why you haven't uh, adopted a particular requirement, which is a should. So um, this is identical to Lexel and again is, is a should. Um, however, there is... Um, there is the prospect of um, cyber essentials becoming compulsory with Lexel accredited practices. Um, the Law Society will be imminently um, uh, launching version seven of Lexel, and it's likely that um, cyber essentials will be a must rather than a should. So for CQS accredited practices, um, I suspect that going forward as the core practice management standard and the standard itself will always be a working document, will always be reviewed um, to identify, you know, um, measures and controls for, you know, for, for plugging the gaps for risks. Um, I would imagine that if Cyber Essentials becomes compulsory for Excel accredited practices, that it is at some point in the future likely to become compulsory for CQS accredited practices. So be mindful of that um, when giving consideration to what your stance is relating to cyber essentials. In relation to the 3.3 um, core practice management standard register, um, this is new, didn't appear in the old standard, so you probably uh, may not have this. Um, I go to a lot of practices to undertake um, you know, uh, reviews of the core practice management documents and effectively um, mock assessments and, uh, and quite often with Lexel accredited practices, they'll put a Lexel register in front of me. Um, regardless of your Lexel status, just make sure that you do cross-reference all the requirements of the core practice management standard against what it is that you um, you have and you're relying on for your core practice management register. So, as I say, there are 40 different requirements, so make sure you identify all of the plans, policies and procedures that are contained within the core practice management standard. You identify who's going to be responsible for each of them, and then you have a procedure for the review of, um, of those uh, policies, plans and procedures. So bear in mind that a procedure needs to be written down. Um, so a procedure is a written set of steps that you will take to achieve something. So a procedure, for example, here would be a document somewhere that states that, you know, we have a, we, we maintain a register of the core practice management standard requirements. This is the register. This is who's responsible. And then you would set out that on a, let's say, annual basis, um, the uh, the policies, plans and procedures will be reviewed by this person at this time. This is what it will take into account. So always think about the, you know, the hows and the whys and the workforce. Um, and what will be taken into account would be things like changes to legislation, changes to regulation, updates to quality standards, um, patterns and trends um, that come out from the practice. Um, you know, uh, guidance from regulators or guidance from the law society um, and best practice. So those are the kind of things that you would be looking at as part of your reviews of your annual um, reviews of policies and, and procedures. So just make sure that's documented. 
Um, people management, so as I say, this is new. We didn't have um, a people management section previously, although we did have some uh, requirements um, that overlap. So we have the, um, the incorporation now into the learning development uh, policy requirements that you need to ensure that appropriate training is provided to personnel. You need to ensure that um, supervisors and managers receive appropriate training. You know, if they're responsible for people, then, you know, they need to ensure that uh, they know how to manage um, that responsibility. And we need to uh, include a procedure to evaluate training. So we've still got the existing requirements, which is to make sure that everybody is up to date in um, client care and conveyance in practice and um, and the CQS um, mandatory training is completed on time and everybody's aware of the core practice management standard and protocols. So that is D, E and F. But obviously, as I mentioned, I'm only showing you the, the, uh, the changes that are relevant to the 2022 update. So go back, have a look at your policy, make sure that you are you know, ensuring that appropriate training is, is being provided to people um, that, uh, that work within the departments and make sure that you do have um, documented procedures for how training is evaluated. And make sure that that training evaluation is, is carried out in the spirit of what it should be. And that is, you know, what am I going to change going forward? You know, what have I learned today from the training that I've done that I'm going to make changes? Um, rather than, you know, the, the quality of the presenter and the quality of the venue and the buffet and that kind of thing, which is all helpful information to a practice. But, you know, but the key spirit is, you know, what am I going to change? What am I going to do differently so that I don't find myself with that Smith file under my desk anymore? Um, so those are the changes to learning and development. We also have the introduction to induction. Um, so if you are um, like Excel accredited, for example, you know, you'd be partly um, meeting this particular requirement. Um, so the induction policy is, is new. So you need to make sure that anybody that is joining the practice or those transferring roles um, are um, inducted and that that induction covers making sure that you identify immediate training requirements and also that you um, as part of that induction process, go through key policies um, that are pertinent to that particular role. So obviously, think about um, your trainees, for example, if you're in a practice whereby they've done a seat in litigation, they've done a seat in the criminal department, and then they come to residential conveyancing to do the third seat, you know, key policies that are going to be pertinent to what they're doing now that they won't necessarily have needed before are things like reporting to lenders, SDLT, leasehold, so that kind of thing. So just make it relevant, basically. Um, and don't forget when people do move within uh, within the departments, even if it is only on a temporary basis, that it is key that they are notified of, of what it is that's, um, that's relevant to them. So that's new. Risk management. So this is the, um, the largest section of the standard, um, the chunkiest section. Uh, we have the um, addition in the supervision requirements for ensuring that personnel adhere to the Law Society conveyance and protocols. So previously in learning and development, we still have the requirement whereby you need to ensure that all relevant personnel um, are aware of the core practice management standard and how the practice comply and that they are aware of the protocols. So now we have this new addition to make sure that actually people follow the protocols as well. So again, you know, how you do that in practice is up to you. Um, it might be that you use your case management system, you've got workflows and that kind of leads by the nose as to what people should be doing next um, based on the answer that they give to the question that pops up on the screen. Um, and a good way of obviously being able to ensure that you um, check adherence um, and that you monitor that is by file reviews. So obviously, you know, when you're doing your um, your independent file reviews on hopefully a monthly basis, that actually do give consideration to incorporating checking that the protocols are being ad adhered to as part of that file review process. So obviously that then all, all fits together. So that's um, that's new. In terms of anti-money laundering, so uh, again, you know, uh, quite chunky, as you would expect, um, one of the biggest risks in um, residential conveyancing. So we have everything that previously um, appeared in the 2019 version of the standard, but we also now have um, a, a slight amendment and addition. So we have this requirement for 
obviously making sure that we comply with legislation, but we need to have a procedure in place for checking and analysing the source of funds and source of wealth and keeping the evidence on the file and the documented analysis. So one thing I will say is always look at the wording of the standard if, you, if you're not quite sure what it is that you should be doing in practice. Um, the wording is key, you know, like I say, if it says must, it applies to everybody, if it says should, it's optional, but you need to document it, if it says procedure, it needs to be written down, um, when it says the word documented analysis, that is exactly what it is, a documented analysis, not a tick in the box, not a series of documents that, you know, there's no evidence that anybody's actually looked at them or analysed them, there's no summary, so this is something that, you know, you really should give some um, some focus to and making sure that that there is evidence on the matters um, whereby we have just more than a bank statement that shows there's £100,000 sat in HSBC. Great. That is evidence of source of funds. But actually, it's about then looking at that bank statement and identifying the, you know, of the £100,000 that sat in HSBC, £60,000 came from this um, particular source and £20,000 came from that source and that date and £15,000 came from this source and that date, you know, and it's then understanding and analysing the source of wealth, which is the accumulation of that money and, um, and documenting it. So the documented analysis should clearly set out the thought process, what the fee owner's thinking, what documentation they've got, what evidence, and then at the end of it, do I have a suspicion? No great, you can move on. If they do, then obviously the steps to be taken internally um, in terms of what they do next, which will be documented in the policy. Um, so that's really, really important. Always work on the basis that, you know, if somebody's looking at the file, um, then think of, you know, the SRA or the NCA coming in on Saturday afternoon, they've got a file, that's all they've got. You're not there to be able to say to them, oh, but well, this is what I would have done, or that's the question that I asked, or I'll just let you know, that's where they got their money from that file needs to tell the story and that's what your documented analysis should look at. And um, I quite often talk about, you know, when we were kids and the teacher always said, um, you know, show your, mark, show your workings out. So if you show your workings out, you might get a mark for it, even if you get the answer wrong. So it's the same kind of principle, you know, from a fee earner's perspective, you know, if someone comes along and requests a file in two and a half years, I'm not as a fee earner going to be able to remember, you know, that particular client or what they said to me. Um, and if the fee is no longer there and it's the MLRO that are sat with the SRA or the NCA, um, then they've got no defence. There's no story, you know, the information isn't on the file. So from a business owner's perspective, from the MLRO's perspective, that's really, really important. And I can't reiterate that enough. Um, and we have the requirements for making sure that there is a documented AML risk assessment present on every file. Now, this has always been contained in the legislation. It was always in the LSAG guidance, Legal Sector Affinity Group, um, and uh, it has now actually been incorporated into CQS as well. So this is Regulation 28 requirements. So you've got your Regulation 18 practice-wide risk assessment requirements, which is uh, I haven't detailed because that's been in the standard for, um, for a few years, um, but we now have this requirement to make sure that you've got a documented risk assessment on every file. And of course, that risk assessment sits hand in hand with your source of funds and source of wealth investigations. So the two documents obviously can be incorporated um, as, uh, as one. So those are important updates to be aware of. We also had an update to the um, 513, which is property and mortgage fraud uh, requirements. And that is to ensure that there is a documented fraud risk assessment on every file making sure that we're giving consideration to all things property and mortgage fraud um, associated with the clients, with the transaction, and also with the other party as well. So, um, so again, that's something that I see uh, missing in, um, in a lot of practices. Um, so the other thing as well is making sure that, yeah, we are giving consideration to property and mortgage fraud and not just mortgage fraud. So that's a new requirement, um, which so you should have your AML risk assessment and your fraud risk assessment on files. We also had the addition to the SDLT um, policy requirements, which is making sure that we also have included a procedure for giving clients um, clear and timely advice in relation to SDLT, and also that we are defining first time buyer and major interest in a dwelling. 
um, because if we are asking clients the question but not giving them the definitions, then of course they're not really making an informed choice. So we need to make sure that we tell them that information. We also need to make sure that there is a procedure for ensuring that the practice um, provides the clear written SDLT calculation to the client at the outset as well. So again, those two things go hand in hand with your initial documentation that provides your quote, um, your SDLT um, questionnaire. Um, so just make sure that you kind of focus and, and ensure that you are meeting those particular requirements that, um, that were incorporated in May last year. We also have the addition for um, the additions for leasehold um, procedures. So we need to make sure that we are giving full, clear and accessible written advice. And what the spirit of that means is that uh, obviously it needs to be accessible, it needs to be in plain English, it needs to be understandable. Um, but the spirit is that we are giving full information to the client. So we're not just providing them a copy of the lease and saying, we will draw your attention to the restrictive covenants which you need to comply with contained in Schedule 4 on page 12, which I do read on a very regular basis. We need to be setting out um, the clear information that is particular to that lease um, to the client. The SRA did put out some um, guidance about 18 months, two years ago, I think it was, to say that you know that kind of that kind of um, reporting to the client would not deem to be acceptable to them. Um, we need to make sure that we explain to them the difference between freehold property and leasehold property. So that's a new requirement. As I say, key information appropriate to that particular lease needs to be explained to them in full. And of course, we need to uh, give consideration to any um, specific lender requirements um, specific to that particular property as well, even if there is not a lender involved. Because of course, you know, as we all know, there may be circumstances in the future where the property is sold and the person that is purchasing the property um, is, um, is uh, getting a mortgage. And then, of course, you know, those are going to be relevant issues for, for them. So that's something to, uh, to give consideration to is how you report into your client in relation to leasehold property. Um, client care. So this is um, section six of the standard. Um, this is one of those particular requirements that has been stripped down slightly. So again, with the old standard, I, can't remember, I think it was 4.1 in the previous standard, we had a lot more information. So it was, you must communicate the following to the clients in writing at the outset of the matter. And we had, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Um, so, you know, make sure you tell the clients of the status of the person who's handling the matter. Um, so name and status, the name and status of the supervisor, complaints information, all this kind of thing. So that all still exists, but it's just been moved to the guidance. So um, where I read something recently to say you no longer need to tell the client about um, is incorrect. You do, because, of course, a lot of that is regulatory requirements anyway. So um, but key to CQS, uh, we need to make sure that we are giving um, full likely timescales um, of the transaction and how that can be affected. And of course, agree an appropriate level of service as well. So that's something that needs to be um, communicated to the clients at the outset. We also have um, a couple of additions to the procedures uh, needed for dealing with lenders. So firstly, we need to explain um, that the lender is a client where obviously there is a mortgage involved and the practice is acting for both parties. And then we have this new procedure whereby practices need to ensure that they are reviewing part two of the UK Finance Handbook and that they are recording um, that check on the file. So again, you know, none of this is prescriptive. Um, you know, there are different ways of doing this. Tech is a really good way of being able to um, support this particular requirement, um, particularly where, you know, we've got changes to the lender's handbook, um, which may, you know, have uh, taken effect from the point of, having carried out the first check when the mortgage offer came in to, you know, the um, a check prior to exchange of contracts, you know, if, uh, if there's, um, there's been any changes. So, um, so this is something, again, I'm, I'm not kind of seeing a great deal of compliance in practice. Um, you do need to make sure that there is evidence on the file that this check has been has been made because obviously without any evidence, it didn't happen. And that is um, that's something that I say. On the mouth of an auditor, um, but there should always be evidence to be able to demonstrate that a particular requirement has uh, has been met. Um, so that's the changes to the dealing with lenders um, 
requirement. We also have some um, addition to the um, complaints handling procedure. Um, so complaints handling also give consideration to compliance with the transparency rules, which is um, 6.2. No updates there, but obviously uh, publishing your complaints procedure on the website is a um, is a, a, a an SRA transparency rules requirement. So the two things do do go hand in hand. Um, have a look at your complaints handling procedure. Make sure that you are telling the client that the complaint will be dealt with promptly, fairly, and free of charge. Make sure that you are telling the client of their ability to um, uh, refer to the legal ombudsman. Do be mindful, obviously, of the changes that take effect on Saturday, the first of April, in relation to those timeframes for changes um, to. Uh, when the client can um, can expect the legal ombudsman to investigate a complaint. Um, need to tell the client that their ability to be able to refer to the SRA in certain circumstances, so discrimination, breach of code of conduct, and also you need to ensure the client um, is aware of your stance in relation to uh, alternative dispute resolution slash mediation. Um, so that is a regulatory compliance um, requirement and also uh, free of charge is a regulatory requirement. So just make sure that uh, that your complaints procedure does include um, reference to, you know, we will investigate your complaint um, free of charge. Um, we also have um, this requirement now, which is to ensure that all complaints are recorded centrally and that you undertake a, a root cause analysis and you, you are identifying the cause of problems. There's always a reason why. Um, and that obviously you keep appropriate records, you know, identifying what the address was was for the client. Um, and of course, you know, any remedial action that's come out of identifying that cause and, and how that's then fed into um, future policy and procedures. So those are the changes to um, to the complaints requirements. And then finally, Section 7, file and case management. Um, we have the addition where we need to make sure that we have some kind of procedure in place to manage um, the reduction of uh, avoidable avoidable requisitions from HMLR. So again, you know, we'll all be doing something in practice, but it's making sure that there is a procedure that kind of sets out that this is how we do it, this is how we make the checks, this is who does it, um, and this is you know um, what we will go through before we submit the um, the uh, AP one. And again, you know, tech can support that. Um, and um and you know and where is the guidance what you know where do we go for uh, for any additional information in terms of um, complex applications so that's something that needs to be documented again remember that if the word says procedure it needs to be written down um and we also need to make sure that we're advising clients that they are able to register up to three service addresses um so again how you choose to do that is up to you it might be that you incorporate the question in your client questionnaire at the outset, so at least you've got the information to then be able to build into your uh, key documents going forward. Um, practices I've seen where they, you know, they actually tell the client in the report. Um, and again, you know, I've got practices where I see the closing letter to the clients that um, says, thanks very much for instructing us. Here's your title information document. We'll be aware that, um, you know, that you can register up to three service addresses, keep them up to date, et cetera, et cetera. So, again, you think about what works for, for your practice. Um, but that's a new requirement. So that didn't exist in the uh, 2019 version of the standard. So those are the updates to the uh, 2022 version. Hopefully um, you're all aware of those and you have taken steps to, to make sure that you've got your documentation in practice and that you are obviously um, following them and there is evidence available. Um, in terms of the on-site assessments, as I said, the Law Society stated that you needed to be assessment ready from 1st of May 22. Those assessments are being carried out. Um, they are currently being carried out in small numbers, um, but on um, in due course, those numbers um, will be increased. Um, but there are different types of practices being assessed, or Lexel assessed, uh, Lexel accredited practices, We've got non-Lexile accredited practices, large um, regional practices, smaller sole practitioners. So various different profiles of practices are, are having those on-site assessments um, uh, carried out. Um, there is an emergence of, um, of core patterns and trends, which um, if you've ever heard me talk about them before, um, will probably come as no surprise. Um, they are the key areas that are um, specific to um, CQS exclusive requirements, um, but also those areas where 
um, there are you know updates to the to the standard, but where there is also the um, the exposure to key risks in, in residential conveyancing. So um, one thing just before I kind of uh, point out to you what those areas of, um, of non-compliance and what those key patterns and trends are, um, something that I kind of always want to tell everybody I talk to about CQS. Um, and, you know, again, if you've heard me speak before, you will have 100% heard me talk about a three-tier process. So it's really important that you do um, remember that. Um, so the three-tier process that I talk about is say as you do, do as you say, and provide the evidence. And that really is key to demonstrating compliance. So I see a lot of information whereby, um, you know, there's um, kind of marketing, um, the you know marketing messages that are put out there about you know if you um, if you purchase this policy you know that will ensure that you're CQS compliant. That's not the case at all. You always need to make sure that you um, have a policy and procedure that is in place that reflects what you do in practice. It reflects um, your individual um, exposures to those risks in practice. As I say, you know one practice is different to the practice down the road. Um, so you actually set out in accordance with what core practice management standard says that should be in those policies, you set out what your stance is. This is our stance, this is our policy, and these are our internal procedures. So these are the steps that we take to achieve the outcome. Um, and then, of course, you make sure that you do it in practice. And that is key, that you do need to have the alignment between say as you do and do as you say. So if your policy says that, you know, um, we do A, B and C, and then in practice you actually um, carry out D, E and F, then your outcome from your on-site assessment would be that you would have non-compliances because you are in breach of your own policy. So that's really, really important to note that, um, regardless of whether you're buying the Law Society CQS toolkit or, you know, whether you're writing your policies yourself or whether you're obtaining them from somewhere else, do make sure that they actually accurately reflect what it is that you're doing in practice and that they meet the requirements of the core practice management standard. So say as you do, do as you say, that's really important, but of course, just as important is making sure that you've got the evidence as well. So when I said earlier about, you know, the SRA or the NCA come in, they look at a file, you're not there to be able to tell them, I would have done that, or oh, I remember having that conversation with that client two and a half years ago, and this is what they said, you know, that information should be on the file. So without evidence, it didn't happen. Um, quite often I will see in CQS and um, Lexile accredited practices, the requirements for um, checking the identity of the other side's conveyancer. You know, you need to have a policy that sets out, this is our stance. You need to make sure that you're doing it in practice. When we interview people, I'll say, how do you check the identity of the other side's conveyancer? They'll tell me, hopefully there'll be an alignment in those two things. And then I'll look at the file and that's where I need to see the evidence. So that's where I'll be looking for, you know, a printout of the Law Society finder solicitor or a file note from where they've called the firm to check um, that that person is there. Um, a screenshot if we're looking at electronic um, uh, files. So again, making sure that the evidence is there is, is key. So always remember that three tier process. Say as you do, do as you say and provide the evidence. Um, so common areas of non-compliance, so patterns and trends that I have been coming across now for probably about three years. Um, so business continuity plan um, requirements, make sure that you are documenting that you will test it on an annual basis, set out how you will test it, um, and make sure that you have evidence of that testing available. So um, again, you know, it's evidence of testing, it's not good enough to say, well, of course, we all went to work at home in 2020. Uh, March 2020. So, of course, we've tested the business continuity plan. Um, firstly, that was now over three years ago. We can't rely on that anymore. Business continuity plan um, should be robust. It should be up to date. There's always emerging um, um, risks that we should be aware of. Things like scenario testing for a ransomware attack is, you know, um, a, a clear omission that I see from business continuity plan testing or, you know, documentation but actually it's something that we really all should be sitting down the table um, with the IT department and, you know, with the, the culp and the coffer and, you know, all those people that carry out those roles and practices to say, you know, okay, let's pretend I've come in, I've found this fax. Um, what do we do? How do we continue to run the business? So that's something that's um, uh, seen um, a, an area of improvement. 
financial verification procedures. So, you know, what's the authorizations look like? I'm a fee earner, I need to pay £600,000 to the um, client whose property we've just sold. What process do I need to go through um, to verify those bank details? Who's it authorized by? Um, you know, what do the accounts departments expect to see when they receive the instructions to make that payment? Um, if the if you've got money coming in from or going out to high risk third countries, what extra steps are you taking? Those are the kind of um, patterns and trends that I see in relation to financial um, procedures that quite often are not documented. It might be that you're doing things operationally, but again, we need to make sure that all these things are written down. Anti-money laundering, practice wide risk assessment, make sure it's been reviewed recently since the um, the uh, LSA guidance was um, signed off and, and finalised in summer 2022. That was a trigger for a review. Um, and make sure that you are referencing the LSAG guidance in that practice-wide risk assessment, as well as the SRA sectoral risk assessment, the Treasury national risk assessment, uh, make sure it's signed off by the uh, MLRO, make sure it's got the approval of the booms, um, the um, business owners, and um, another key area is matter risk assessments. So um, what I said to you earlier about the documented analysis, of source of funds and source of wealth evidence, um, and also the AML um, matter level risk assessments. Again, seeing a lot of uh, omission operationally on, in practices where they just don't have that in place. So that's um, a key area. And then um, no documentation setting out the firm's stance in relation to undertaking an independent AML audit function. Um, and the appointment of a money laundering compliance officer, um, both of which are regulatory um, obligations because your regulatory obligations are to comply with legislation. They are incorporated into the legislation. The, the SRA published their um, AML thematic review report in October and said that I think 50% of the firms that they visited didn't have an AML audit function in place, of which about 50% they expected to have in place. So do give consideration um, that if you are, you know, a practice that is more than a sole practitioner and one person carrying out the work, that you do give consideration to the fact that the SRA um, are expecting there to be some kind of independent audit function in place. Um, property and mortgage fraud, again, omissions from what um, I see a lot of is the matter level risk assessments um, and also evidence of checking the identity of the other side's conveyance. Conflicts policy. See an awful lot of conflicts policies um, that uh, do not actually set out um, whether we do or do not act on both sides of the matter. So on the matter, we act for the seller, we act for the buyer. Um, and, you know, what happens when we do, you know, what steps that we take to, you know, lock down the case management system, different fee earners, different offices, different supervisors, consent of the clients, all those kind of things. So quite often I see a lot of policies that are either silent on the point or, it's all a bit wishy-washy and basically says that, you know, we don't, but on the occasions that we do, that person needs to authorise it. So it's either you do or you don't. Um, so just give consideration to that. SDLT procedures, see a clear lack of um, any reference to LTT. To make sure that we do have that top of mind awareness. Um, and um, the lack of evidence for the um, verification of the SDLT calculation, which is intended to be a second pair of eyes. So again, you know, where is that evidence? You know, who, where do I find that on the file that, um, that somebody else has checked that calculation? And then cross-checking the consideration in the contract, the transfer, the SDLT return against the payment out of um, client ledger, which is intended to be a post um, completion, post payments check to make sure that the right amount of money has been paid out. Um, leasehold procedures, not seeing um, a lot of documentation going to clients to actually explain what the difference is between freehold and leasehold, because obviously that's um, that's new. And again, um, see too many reports to clients that refer them to the restricted covenants on page 12 in Schedule 4. Um, so again, full clear advice um, needs to be um, uh, imparted to the, to the client. Dealing with reporting to lenders, um, documented uh, procedures for how part two of the UK finance handbook is being dealt with um, and operationally you know how is that happening I don't see a lot of um, evidence of it being recorded 
Um, and I do talk to a lot of practices where they haven't yet started kind of following these um, these procedures. So um, that's really important. Um, if you've heard me before, you know, you will know that the uh, CQS accreditation was originally developed to bring assurance to the lending communities as to the quality and integrity of member practices. So the lenders are very keen to make sure that these things are still um, in place and being followed. Um, and um, detailing the reporting requirements rather than saying that, you know, we must report to the lender, actually setting out that we're reporting to the lender, um, this is how we do it, this is what we tell them, you know, this is um, this is the, the responsibilities and the timeframes and the costs and all those kind of things. So again, make sure that your policy says that this is how we do it and make sure the pickable file that you have reported to the lender that you are actually giving that right information. HMLR property alert service. Um, so make sure that your closing letter to the client says, thanks for instructing us, here's your title information document. We would draw your attention to HMLR property alert service um, because it's there to protect you. Um, so again, make sure that that is you know, one of the last things that you say to the client so that you are putting them on notice at a point that it means something to them. Um, and similarly, um, in relation to the new HMLR um, requisition procedures. Um, I'm not seeing a lot of documentation actually setting out what those procedures look like internally um, and lack of um, operational um, processes that people are actually going to to make sure that they are cross-referencing documents and that you know that document uh, Tracy is spelled with an E and that document Tracy has no E, which is correct. Um, so those are um, areas of non-compliance. Those are clear patterns and trends. Just keeping my eye on the time. Um, so, you know, if you have the time to kind of just go back and look over this, those particular areas, make sure that you are not falling into these categories of, um, of these um, emergence of, of patterns and trends um, that I see an awful lot, you know, two or three times a week, quite often in practice. Um, so just moving on um, swiftly to what's new for CQS in 2023. Um, make sure your SRO, your senior responsible officer, does keep an eye out for um, emails from the Law Society because they don't spam. They will be giving you valuable information. Um, and, um, and some of the information that has been um, sent out to SROs recently will have um, given you the heads up in relation to uh, changes, firstly, to the application process. So this is something I think the Law Society sent an email out in October. Um, identifying that, um, that there will be changes to, um, to the process. Obviously, the last 13 years has been a paper-based exercise in terms of the, you know, sending over the uh, reaccreditation application form, depending which form you use, depends on where you are in your three-year cycle. Um, there will be a new portal that is due to be launched imminently. Um, there will be a start date for that. Um, so keep your eye out for, for that email. The, there will be new questions, so the whole process has been reviewed, so there will be a set of um, new questions that apply to all practices, so there won't be different questions for different practices depending on where they are in their cycle. Um, the key to this particular um, portal is that um, it will be, you know, the kind of systems that you will be used to using by now, which is, you know, you answer the question, you then upload the document, and then once you've answered the question, you've uploaded the corresponding evidence, the corresponding documents, that X will then turn to a tick. Once you have completed the whole form, you can dip in and out of it, you can save it and come back to it, that kind of thing. But only when you have um, completed all the questions, uploaded all the supporting documents and all those crosses have turned to ticks, will the submit button then become live for you to be able to click submit. One thing that practices really do need to be aware of is that um, there is um, the, the practices will need to make sure that that application is submitted by their own personal CQS expiry date. So make sure that you are aware of what the expiry date is, that you submit before that date, um, because if you don't, then your CQS accreditation will automatically lapse. So there will be the ability for practices to be able to apply to the Law Society for a one off one month extension. Um, and that will be a one time only extension. Um, and it is at the discretion of the Law Society as to whether that extension is granted. Um, but that will be chargeable. So practices will have to pay an administration fee, which I think is being toyed at about £113 pounds 
um, for that fee at the moment. But again, you know, if you don't submit by the uh, the deadline at the end of that one month extension, then you're going to be in the same position whereby um, your accreditation um, will lapse. So it's really, really important for practices to actually um, make sure that they do take note of the information that is being provided to the um, to the SRO. Also, the um, portal itself will be intelligent. So at the moment, um, you know, like with a lot of things that we, you know, we all deal with historically, you get the information in and then it's a, a manual process to identify, well, that practice has said this and, you know, that might expose them to a particular risk and, um, and we might, you know, we might need to have a look at that practice because um, of these things that they have said on the application form. This new system that's been developed by the Law Society will extract all of that information for them. That will identify what I would probably define as a heat map. And then that will allow the Law Society to profile practices, identify key areas where practices may need some engagement, and, um, and they'll be able to use that information intelligently to be able to identify which practices they're, they're going to then um, go out and do the um, next on-site assessments for. So, so it's going to make um, the Law Society's um, job a lot easier in identifying who they're coming out to next in terms of the on-site assessments. Also, you will have um, read, um, if you've read your emails um, over the last um, few weeks, that there is now a formal um, SRO exam which needs to be undertaken. So even if your SRO has been in place for say six years um, and they've done the original SRO course, um, every SRO will need to take this exam. So the information has been pushed out there. Um, I can't remember the actual cost of the exam, but it is, um, it's, it's available in the uh, Law Society learning um, platform. Um, so all SROs will need to, uh, will need to do that. Um, and um, I believe that last week, I think it was, that the Law Society did actually put out um, an, uh, some guidance in terms of uh, a course that they're running to prepare SROs for undertaking that exam, of which they'll have two attempts to, to pass it. So those are, are new, what's new for CQS in 2023. So quite a lot. If you've not yet got scripts with what it is that you should be doing in practice and your document of policies and procedures and making sure that you have that three tier process in place, you've now got um, these additions of, you know, dealing with the online um, application process and, of course, for the SRO to undertake that exam as well. Um, so that's me. Um, I'm sorry, there's a lot of information I provided to you in the last hour. I didn't intend to talk so long, but um, InfoTrack are fully aware now that when I start talking about CQS, I tend to often overrun. So do apologise, um, Lisa. Um, if there are any questions, um, we'll deal with them after Lisa Edwards from InfoTrack has spoken to you. And uh, without further ado, thank you very much for listening to me. Um, I will pass you over to Lisa Edwards from InfoTrack and, um, and she'll have a chat to you now. Thanks, Tracy. Brilliant. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Lisa Edwards from InfoTrack and I'm just going to share my screen with you. Just bear with me. So hopefully what you are seeing on your screen and Tracy, if you can give me the thumbs up as well, you should be seeing a PowerPoint presentation, InfoTrack and CQS. OK, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> That's great. Um, so thanks, Tracy. Hello, everyone. Um, so here um, in this forum, um, there are users of InfoTrack, some new, some old, and some who have never used InfoTrack before. So hopefully in the next 10 minutes, I'll be able to give you a whistletop tour ta of how InfoTrack can support you in meeting your CQS criteria. OK, so um, at InfoTrack, our technology um, genuinely assists conveyancing teams in meeting some of the criteria needed for CQS compliance. Um, and of course, as you all are aware, choosing the right technology for your firm can streamline inter internal processes to ensure that the say as you do, do as you say um, method is followed without concern or worry. And as you are aware, or you may not be aware, but you will be in a second, we at InfoTrack offer you an end-to-end firm-wide platform that is usable and visible to all members of your team, should you want them to see it. And our key focus here is to take the pain away in the day-to-day -day gathering and submission of data within a conveyancing process. 
So we've developed our website um, and our portal just to basically assist you in making it easier to gather that digital information. And by doing so, we naturally meet the criteria um, um, for CQS. We do work very closely with Tracy as lead assessor um, and also the Law Society and other regulatory bodies as well to ensure that the technology that we do develop supports you, um, saves you time, makes you more efficient, but crucially backs up um, the CQS criteria as well. So as Tracy mentioned, the core practice management standards now fall into seven categories. And what I've done here for the first four sections, um, structure and info track, is just highlight um, the areas where we can um, assist you to tick the boxes, basically, and um, fly through your CQS assessment. So section one, structure and strategy. So with InfoTrack, it is a firm-wide account. When you sign up for InfoTrack, you can set up as many users within the firm who need to um, act in the conveyancing team. And you can see at any point what's going on with any case. So if somebody's off or um, if you need quick access to data, you can simply log on, look for the matter and find the information that you need straight away. So it just means that when you are stating um, that you use InfoTrack for gathering and submitting data for for um, conveyancing, you do know that all of your users are trained to use the platform and therefore adhering to your processes and procedures. And it gives standardization across all conveyancing services as well. So the transparency side of things, knowing that every single fee owner acts in the same way, offers the same searches, the same service and so on. We allow you to um, um, develop a standard practice throughout your conveyancing procedure. I'm not going to go through every single section, by the way. I'm going to show you the website in a second. But financial management as well for um, InfoTrack. There's lots of new things that's been added to the core practice management standards, source of wealth checks, um, online banking checks, and so on and so forth. And we do have an electronic client onboarding service, which allows your clients, uh, will allows you to onboard your client um, and instruct them and get all of the documentation signed as you would expect. But it allows you to to identify your clients to confirm they are who they say they are with their ID documents and um, with um, with um, um, utility bills and so on. But we also go a step, step further and allow your client to send their bank um, statements and so on through to you electronically. And if there's a source of wealth check that needs to be done, ECOS can help you out as well. Um, one invoice as well. So when you use InfoTrack, you're not juggling invoices per matter. It just allows you to streamline your invoicing process. Um, one invoice for every single thing. And of course, we integrate with Mercy MS um, um, case management providers as well. So when you have integration with us, it means that everything is, is started from your case management system. So that means that data population is at its best. And also every single search results that you order, regardless of what it is, will land straight back into the case as well. So again, for providing evidence, knowing that you can go straight to InfoTrack website or straight to your case management to show the documentation of, of what you need to be doing, it's all in one place. So you, you can't go wrong really with that. And then from an information po policy point of view, um, one portal for everything really, really streamlines itself from there as well. And we do have tight integration with LMS too. So for um, your reporting to the lender side of things, we take care of that automatically. Your InfoTrack account is linked with your LMS portal automatically. So updates are fed back through to LMS automatically as soon as you order the products that are relevant. People management, a fairly new area in the CPMS, but again, as I mentioned earlier, if everyone in your conveyancing team is using um, InfoTrack, a firm wide account allows them to know that that is, their, that is your best practice, that is your process. So we provide all of the training for your current users and any new users as well. And lots of our clients um, literally write us into the induction program as well. So when you get new starters, you know you are forever supported by InfoTrack with a, a, a robust and dedicated account manager. Now, risk management is probably the biggest section where InfoTrack do help you, recording key dates, AP1 requisition management, and so on. And I'll show you in a section in a sec second the sections on our website which help you with this. Client care is absolutely um, key on here. Um, and the property report, which is I'm going to show you in a little bit of depth in a second as well, just allows you to send out your report on title 
a lot quickly, a lot more quickly, a lot more efficiently, and also how it can convert the title for you. So your um, restricted covenants um, can be picked up very easily. That data is digital, so we can populate your property report very, very quickly for you. And as I've mentioned, section, section seven, file and case management, we integrate with mo most case management providers. Therefore, um, you can rest assured that all of the evidence that you need to submit in a CQS assessment is safely lodged within um, your file matter. So what I'm going to do is just quickly go over to the website just to show you people who haven't seen this in depth or never seen it before or have dabbled with InfoTrack and not used all of our services, just to show you and point out the key areas which can support you. So what you have within InfoTrack is the ability to see all existing orders. Now, um, as I mentioned, this is a firm wide account, so it will show everything that's been ordered on a matter at any time. Now, this can be truncated, of course, to look at your own, um, but you can see all by standard. Left, over to the left, we have a number of dashboards to allow you to find information quickly. So if I just wanted to check on my AMLs, for example, I can just go over to the AML dashboard and it will list everything on there that is applicable to um, um, AML very, very quickly. Um, over to the right, we have news and events. Um, so, of course, all of the webinars that we actually host are here for you to register for. But down here, we have the calendar over to the right. And the calendar is great for recording your key dates. So when does your priority um, searches expire, for example? When do they need refreshing? When you order your priority searches through us, uh, we automatically build in um, um, reminders. So there's no way that you can actually miss a date to refresh that document. So again, go away from your paper-based system, your spreadsheet data to try and remember or writing on the file when you need to refresh. We take care of that for you. And this links into AP1s as well. So when you get a requisition request come through, um, it, we will highlight anything that's due to be acknowledged. And remember, this is firm wide. So if a colleague who submitted the AP1 is away on holiday, somebody else within the, the practice can pick that up and answer and deal with a requisition and so on. Now, um, the calendar is not a future calendar. Um, literally, it's historical. So as soon as you start using InfoTrack, the calendar will kick in. And therefore, if you need to show records of key dates and so on, InfoTrack will allow you to see that straight away. Now, going up to the uh, workflow at the top, what we try to do is capture all of the information you are likely to gather on a sale or purchase, whether it be residential or commercial. And um, so, as I mentioned earlier, we have our electronic client onboarding um, service, which does allow you to um, send out your TA forms digitally so your client can fill them in, returning them to you 100% complete, so no need to chase. Um, and that, that's where the um, AML checks live, the verification of ID and the verification of funds as well. So this is what links into your the online bank statements and also um, gives you your source of wealth checks and so on and so forth. This can all be sent out electronically to your client um, and they then visit a portal, whether it be via a branded app or via a branded website where they can fill all of that data in. 100% secure. We have two tier um, um, verification in here to ensure your client is onboarding in a safe way. Now, all of the documentation you request them to actually complete or digitally sign is then landed straight back into InfoTrack or straight back into your case management system. We've got contract of sale as well. So um, contract of sale just allows you to compile your contract of sale within seconds, really. And that just basically allows you to order your office copies, bring them through here and also um, search for your EPC and um, free of charge and so on. But really, rather than trying to gather all of the documents that you need for your contract of sale, it logically leads on from onboarding to allow you to compile that document document in, se um, in seconds. And of course, it will include the TA13, but that can be ordered independently as well. So I skip the search area because we do a lot more than searches. But of course, we do do conveyancing searches. Searching is very much a commodity. Therefore, what we've tried to do with, um, with our offering is give you value when you search with us. So that leads me nicely over to the productivity section, which then shows you your property report. So all of the points that um, Tracy was mentioning in her, in her presentation regarding do as you say, say as you do, and make sure that everybody's following the same process, the property report really is the height of standardization, in my opinion. The property report will just basically take all of the searches that you've ordered previously on that particular case, 
um, and will basically allow you to compile um, a property report within seconds. Now, we do know that on a purchase, you very rarely order the office copies, but as part of the service, we include the title for that particular proper, property or titles, and it allows you to build a property report, whether it's freehold, leasehold or unregistered, and of course, for new build as well. So the title or titles will be automatically ordered for you as part of the service as will the data sources that you've ordered on this matter to compile your report. So, of course, your searches will be included. I'll come on to SDLT in a second, but over to the right are your appendices. Now, um, when I click on order, that will actually compile the report for me. So if I just pop in a matter number quickly, and this report will be standard to your firm. It can be bespoke. A template can be built to make sure that you are um, stamping your brand on the report itself. But of course, what we do is digitally read the data that have come back from all the information points on um, the data information gathering that you've done so far. So all of the searches are read digitally and the report is then truncated to meet the requirements for that particular property. So if it's, um, for example, a leasehold property, we will extract the information that you need to report to your client on leasehold. And that's a very key fact in the new um, CPMS guidelines as well. So this is our report here, and over to the left are the sections that need attention with a little um, triangle on there. That takes two seconds to go through. It's just basically saving the text that we recommend for that particular property. And then you will see as well that when I actually um, take a look at the report on title, you will see as I scroll down the report, the boundaries, the property, the party walls, the um class of title, the covenants and so on are extracted from the digital register to actually populate the report itself. And again, if you report incrementally, you can actually report the property details, inquiries from the seller from here, just the search part as well. So if I just wanted to report on searches, I could just basically untick the boxes and the report can then be generated to be report on, on searches only. And you will see here that um, planning permission, for example, for this particular property, and there are permitted development rights. So it's just highlighting me to the facts of Article 4 and so on, make sure I'm happy with it, and you can pre-populate that as well. And what you can actually do on here as well is publish at any time. So um, if you just want to publish incrementally or as a whole, you can, and you can go backwards and forwards into here. But what we've tried to do here is, again, to meet requirements of CQS and to make your um, process of reporting on title standard and efficient. Um, we've created just this single workspace, which allows you to do everything without to and fro in, cutting, cutting and pasting, typing manually and so on and making mistakes. We've taken the um, process of producing this for you. And when you actually do publish, of course, you can decide what you want to publish. You can include all attachments, which are the searches um, and the information that's there. We do include glossaries as standard, so it's a nice report for your client to read. And of course, um, everything is customizable on here. So your front cover can represent your brand. Um, it can be bespoke to how you want it to look. But again, it brings standardization straight away. And of course, sometimes you need to upload your own documentation to support your report and title. So you have that facility to add to it as well. So all in one space, creating your property report within 15 minutes on a typical freehold property should make it more efficient and error free. But importantly, it brings out and reports on the clauses that are needed to meet the CQS requirements. In there as well, we've got lender handbooks, so a bank check um, section now I'm taking a look at. Um, lender Handbook um, appears regularly in the CPMS and is a relatively new addition um, to the core practice management state statements. How do you check the Lender Handbook and where is it documented? Lender Handbook is built into InfoTrack as standard. So both, um, so all parts, parts one through to three. Um, the way that you actually search for changes can be very manual. You can actually just basically type in what you actually want to search, attach it to a matter. You can search for updates whenever you want, but you can also be alerted. <clears throat> so all of the lenders are listed here. So if you are working with a particular lender for a particular case, you can just be notified when anything changes. And that will drop the results and the report of the changes straight back into InfoTrack and straight back into your case management system. If you are 
if you are integrated with us from your case management system. And also as well, it will alert you via email that there are changes. So you can actually be rest assured that you're not going to miss any update from the lender, lender handbook um, during a transaction as well. But it's historical. It will allow you to search for anything that you want. And it's built in as standard to InfoTrack. And then finally, before we end this session, just moving over to post completion. Now, stamp duty, of course, here is the stamp duty procedure. The beauty about InfoTrack, if you've never used it before, is that by the time you are ready to do your stamp duty on a case and you've used us for searches, for your land registry documents, for indemnities and so on and so forth, you will find that this is 90 percent populated. So you will find that um, Compiling and submitting an SDLT takes no longer than two minutes, basically. Um, all you have to just basically um, access and answer a few standard questions and then away it goes. And of course, like anything within InfoTrack, all of your documentation will drop straight back into case management or into InfoTrack, as well as your Form 5 and supporting documents that support that as well. All of you working out, there is a calculator on there. So all of you working out that you need to show um, as part of CQS is built into that as well. So once you've submitted the SDLT, you do have a separate document showing your workings out for the calculation of the stamp. Um, and then finally, AP1. So digital AP1s have been our thing now for um, coming on to seven years. Um, and this will meet all requirements from the land registry regarding recording things digitally when it comes to posting your AP1. Now, what we do differently within InfoTrack <coughs> is that we, um, again, pre-populate your AP1 for you. So that by the time you're ready to do this registration, this will be, again, 90% complete. Um, and any documents that you've uploaded, sorry, any documents that you've ordered from InfoTrack will instantly be uploaded in here. So the time saving that you get from our post completion tools is paramount. Think of all the units that you're going to save internally. Plus, because we are digitally reading documents to support this case, um, the likelihood of error um, becomes minimal because um, um, obviously human error we can hit various keys on the keyboard sometimes by accident and then raise a get a requisition raised. But land registry tell us by using InfoTrack for your AP1 submissions, naturally. Um, so it's a safe way of, of, of doing AP1 through us, very time efficient and very easy to do with pre-population. But what we also back that up with, when you use us for AP1s, over to the left-hand side. So again, thinking about CQS requirements, how do you deal with requisitions? What, what is your um, route of recording the requisition trail and so on and so forth? The AP1 dashboard over to the left-hand side will allow you to see everything that's going on with your AP1 across the firm, remember. So I can see there's a requisition outstanding on this one here. So if I give that a click, I can actually then and see what the requisition is. And if need be, so if I wanted to see the requisition, I just click on requisition PDF. Yes, I can answer that requisition. Therefore, um, I can respond to the requisition directly from here. So again, all of these responses will be recorded um, as an audit trail within InfoTrack and within case management. So I can then respond to the requisition automatically or I can just literally um, request a HMLR action. So if I wanted to um, um, request an extension of time, I can do this. Now, where this saves you time, um, obviously dealing with the requisitions is all in one space, but these queries or these answers go directly to the land registry operator who raised the requisition in the first place. Likewise, so do the actions. So it saves you time having to call, be on the phone for a long time. You can do all of this digitally, knowing that's going on in the background. You can move on to your next piece of work. But everything is recorded and everything that we build within InfoTrack is there to support you with your quality audits, but also as a firm as well to bring standardisation. So that's um, it from the website point of view. But if I just basically just go back to that presentation, just to close off for a second. And um, the Law Society um, allowed us to use this basically and um, to say that technology obviously is moving forward very, very fast and choosing the right technology to support your practice is paramount. Um, while there is no requirement currently that plans, policies and procedures, registers and records will be in electronic format, 
pra uh, practices are encouraged to do so. This is because records and registers are easier to curate, supervise and share when held digitally. So even though it's not a must, um, the Law Society do recognise that storing things digitally with technology just allows you to um, evidence quickly when it comes to CQS. So that's it really. So thank you very much for your time. A copy of these slides will be sent to you, mine and Tracy's, um, following this presentation. And also as well, just to let you know, InfoTrack have created a new guide, which just basically condense everything that I've mentioned for quick reference through here. So you can see there, there's a, a brilliant quote from Tracy already on here, but this um, guide will be sent to you as well. And it just quickly highlights how we support you with compliance within InfoTrack. So that will be on its way to you shortly. So without further ado, thank you very much for your time. I'll hand over to Faye to close down with questions and answers. Lovely. Thanks ever so much indeed, both of you. Um, we have had a couple of questions through. I'm conscious that we're short on time, so I'll go through them very quickly. First one is for Tracy. Um, Tracy, do we have to go back and rectify any files? Or if it's the case that we're doing it now and past issues have been rectified, so wouldn't be held accountable, i.e. a file a couple of years back that has closed or maybe still open? Um, OK, so, I mean, obviously, you can imagine some practices that would have, you know, tens of thousands of, of closed files. Um, so that would uh, not be an expectation. Um, just work on the basis that, you know, from the point of knowledge that you are looking to continually improve and to make changes so that you are compliant with CQS going forward, there would be no expectation in you going back retrospectively, because that would be something that um, that just would not be achievable in, in a lot of practices. Um, when we come out and do the on-site assessments, we will always look at files that have been closed within, say, the last three months, for example, so that we're checking closing procedures. Um, but again, you know, where you are in your point in journey, if you can demonstrate that, well, we didn't do that, but actually this is the point that, you know, we started doing it and you can now see that going forward, this is what we do, then that will be absolutely fine. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, next question for you, Tracy. What should we be saying when pointing out restrictive covenants? Without knowing the client personally, you wouldn't know what applies to them. So, for example, no caravans, et cetera. Um, OK, so the whole point there is that you, you know, you don't know the client personally. So um, if you did know, then you would be making a judgment about a situation that would be in that moment in time. So, for example, caravans, um, it might be that you, if you knew your client and you knew they didn't have a caravan, then it might not be applicable. But you might not necessarily be aware that that is something that are shopping for at the moment. And um, so... The, the spirit of the standard is that you give full, clear and accessible um, legal advice. So that would be to set out to them, you know, that these are restrictive covenants that you should not, you know, keep a caravan on the on the front and, you know, all of those kind of things um, that, you know, are pertinent to people living their lives. So you should spell it out to them. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, next question for you, Tracy. Should we be keeping paper files as well as electronic files and um, most companies are keen on electronic files rather than paper yeah so um obviously over the course of the last three years um everybody has um introduced more technology in the business to be able to uh, to get through the the pandemic and you know we've had uh, we talk about hybrid working now but we also talk about hybrid files as well so the majority of practices that i go into um have some kind of level of electronic files and paper files so um, obviously, Lisa has just um, mentioned the, the quote from the Law Society there in you know, use of uh, technology to ensure, you know, efficiency and, and you know, the, um, a, a better process and, and paper is a risk. And, and that is the case. Um, however, CQS um, is not prescriptive. So it doesn't say that you should run electronic files. It doesn't say you should run paper files. It says that you must have processes in place and procedures in place. So again, that's for you as a practice to identify what works best for you. So a mixture of paper files, and electronic files, as I say, that's what I see on a regular basis, all electronic, all paper, you know, it's a matter for the practice. It's, it's not prescriptive. So you decide. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Lisa, I have a question for you, please. If we're acting on a leasehold property, does the InfoTrack report require us to order a copy of the office copy lease? Also, what information does that pull across into the report? 
Yeah, and um, the, the report will automatically look into the office copy lease for you on that and it will bring a copy through in the standard. If it's digitised, it will pull through the relevant information that's needed to meet the requirements on reporting on the clauses. Um, if you'd like to um, leave your name as well, I will demonstrate, I'll get you a account manager to demonstrate that or get in touch with you on um, myself as well, just to show you how that works. Perfect, thank you. Um, will you be launching a report for new build properties? That one's for Lisa as well, please. Yeah, the report is um, um, there for new builds as well. If the property is leasehold or freehold and so on, there is a new build um, box to tick, which will meet all the reporting requirements for that as well. So the, the property report is designed for new builds as standard. Perfect, thank you. Uh, another question for Lisa. How is InfoTrack charged and how do we pass this on to the client? Okay, it's a free to use portal. So InfoTrack um, is free to use or we charge you for all the purchases of the searches and so on and so forth. And that's listed as disbursements, which you can pass on to your client. We can also do split invoicing as well. <coughs> so say, for example, you didn't want to invoice or pass a cost on for anti-money laundering to your client. We can actually... Um, um, charge that separately as well but basically it's free to use and it's simply pay as you go perfect thank you and um, this question i suspect is probably going to be better answered by tracy the scottish law society provide a standardized risk assessment is anyone aware of the law society offering the same um no <laughs> um, so simple ones that I, I have no uh, knowledge of the law society of england and wales um looking to provide the same standardized risk assessment or comparable I'm afraid. OK, no problem. Uh, another one, I think, for you, please, um, Tracy. You mentioned at 6.2b an appropriate level of service to be agreed with the client. Can you clarify what is meant by that, please? Um, OK, so so service levels. Um, so this is about uh, managing clients expectations, ultimately, which, of course, in residential conveyancing is you know never an easy thing to do in the first place. But, you know, when can when can your clients expect to to hear from you? Um, you know, what is it that they are expecting you to do for them? Um, so, again, you know, it's not prescriptive. It's about making sure that you are giving as much valuable information to the client as possible to you know manage their expectations but also to make your life easier as well so you know you can drill down and you know as and as deeply as you want in terms of you know if you email as you can expect a, a response in this amount of time or you know you can set out um the uh the dream that you know we will endeavor to um but again you consider what what works for your practice and and obviously uh these things are all there to uh, to set standards Perfect, thank you. Um, and the last question is for Lisa, please. Um, this person has had an experience about AP1s and the land registry made a, a mistake on the registration. Um, this person contacted them directly and they have updated the register. But as the AP1 was complicated, uh, was, was completed, the panel cannot show further update. And this person ended up needing to obtain a fresh official copy from land registry. Um, will we be able to look at this issue and resolve it in the future, do you think? Um, yes, I can see that question from Henry, actually. I, was that, Henry, was that done on the InfoTrack website at, um, currently? Actually, what I, yes, it was, yeah. Yeah, it will it will be looked into and resolved in the future. I've taken a note of that, actually, Henry, for our developers to make sure that they look for that. I'll check back in with you, though, once I've got a response, if that's OK, separately. Great. Thank you very much. Well, that's all of the questions. So I'd like to say a big thank you to Tracy Thompson from Thompson, Tracy Thompson Associates and to Lisa Edwards for joining us today. Um, and I hope everyone's found this session useful and helpful and informative. Um, if you do have any other questions about anything you've learned today, either about CQS itself or the technology available to support that journey, then please do contact your account manager um, or reach out to um, us um, directly. And um, this session is being recorded and I know a few people have asked if they're going to get sent copies of the, the PDFs, etc. So, yes, we will be sending you a copy of the recording and any of the notes and presentations that have been referred to within this recording, within this webinar. So all that's left to say is thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks ever so much. Bye. 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 Bye.